Thank you, everyone. Glad to be here. So my name is Mikko Terenhovi. I'm working as the chief product officer in an Estonian startup, Solo, where we are building a new form of entrepreneurship. And uh, today's topic is full stack product, the uneasy path. I was actually thinking when I was uh, traveling to Tallinn on Wednesday that there's a little bit of a negative tone to this title. So maybe I should just change it to something more fitting. So let's change the uneasy path to the exciting path for two reasons. Uh, it's actually pretty exciting to build these kind of products. So you get so deep into the experience of the customer. And also, it should be exciting for the customers to actually use your product. OK, okay let's look into the other side as well. Full stack product. So what does it actually mean? So. Um, the background of this is that I read a blog post something like five years ago by Chris Dixon, uh, where he was uh, describing full stack startups. And it sort of struck me then that that was exactly what I was building. Uh, that, that was really interesting, uh, the whole concept of that one. But uh, actually, it's a little bit an abstract term. So I think a better fitting one would be magical product, because I think the uh, opportunity you have with these kind of full stack products is to actually provide magical experiences for your customers. And this is something I'd like to discuss a little bit today. So a little bit about me. So uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, working as the chief product officer at Solo, where we are building a new form of entrepreneurship. And basically, the idea is that solopreneurs around the world can bypass all that bureaucracy, all that complexity that's usually related to actually running your business and setting it up. So this, in many ways, is a full stack product. So we are taking care of everything needed to actually run your business. Prior to this one, uh, I was a co-founder and uh, VP of product and design in a Finnish startup called Holvi, where we were uh, building uh, neobanking for small businesses. And uh, that was also a very sort of interesting path, which I'll go into as well. But for many reasons, uh, we ended up building a fully full stack experience and we went through all the complexity in building, for example, the banking core ourselves and everything related to, uh, to that one. And prior to all of it, uh, I actually w was working in design. I graduated as an architect. Uh, so here's one building I designed. And uh, this is basically the background also, which I noticed actually much later on. This is the background that I've been building on uh, all the time because uh, I think architecture gives a really good view and uh, sort of perspective in building holistic products because when you are designing a building or a full stack product, you actually have to think about everything around it. So uh, you have to go from macro level to micro level. And uh, this is also the beauty of it, but also the complexity of it. So let's go into the topic of today. So. Uh, what does this full stack actually mean? And I just collected a couple of simple definitions on just to getting a little bit deeper on what I mean by it. So uh, let's start by separating goods and services. Everything's going to be a service in the future anyway. Uh, I just wanted to copy this because I think this quote is pretty funny, or this is actually from Wikipedia, uh, defining uh, the difference between goods and services. And it says that consumption of services, in contrast to the consumption of goods, has no restrictions. That's a joke, I think, because uh, there's definitely restrictions in also scaling services. Next one is uh, bundling versus unbundling. There's this uh, famous quote from Jim Boxdale. He used to be Netscape CEO in the 1990s. And he said that there are only two ways to make money in business. One is to bundle and the other one is to unbundle. So today we'll be looking into bundling. And the third uh, is tasks versus outcomes. So uh, in many cases, uh, startups have been focusing on the task level, but uh, actually what the customers want usually are outcomes. There's a very famous also framework, Jobs to be Done, which fully focuses on the outcomes that the customers want to reach. And uh, here's a simple example of this as well. Uh, do you want a clean home or do you want to take out the trash? So there's 
a set of tasks that get you to your outcome. So uh, we'll be focusing on uh, services, bundling, and outcomes in this presentation. Also, uh, what this uh, full stack actually means. So here's a hypothetical example of uh, uh, basically traveling experience. It might consist of reservation, transportation to the location, maybe some tours there. Uh, you have to pay it somehow, and uh, you might need a travel insurance. So uh, if you take a uh, horizontal approach to this one, uh, you, for example, built the best reservation engine for travel. Uh, it might actually reach a lot of people, and it might uh, be highly successful, but in a sense you're building uh, something for everyone, and uh, usually there's uh, fierce competition with these kind of uh, horizontal solutions. But if you take a customer segment uh, which you choose carefully, let's say that you build a travel experience for the elderly, uh, which might actually be a good idea. You can steal this idea uh, freely. So uh, there actually uh, you are fully focused on the problems and the solutions that this particular customer group wants. And if you actually go deeper uh, into the stacks, so yeah, you want to uh, control the whole experience from the reservation, from the transportation, booking the tours, handling the payments, and uh, also putting the insurance in place for this particular customer group, then you actually have the possibility to build an amazing experience for this customer group. And uh, this uh, also allows uh, the possibility to build a value-based pricing. So actually, it's not based on uh, competition. Uh, of course, there is this component as well, but it's more, fo more focused on the value that the customer experiences in getting this kind of an experience. And here, the user experience is uh, fully tailored for the customer. So, uh, as I mentioned, everything is going to be a service in the future. Uh, just to get your uh, mindset around this topic, I picked up a couple of interesting uh, services that uh, have been uh, coming along. So, first one is lighting as a service, which I think is an interesting example. There's a company called LumenStream that installs LED lighting to your office, and they do this completely free, so it doesn't cost anything. But actually, how they charge it uh, is that for the next five years, they charge on the energy saved. So when you have more sufficient, more ecological solution, you actually pay for that. Another interesting example is farming as a service. So there's a company called Small Robot Company. And uh, they deliver these, they're actually really cool looking agriculture robots. And they deliver these for free uh, for farmers. But again, how they charge is per hectare of healthy crops. And the last one is my favorite. So Rolls-Royce aircraft turbines, they are completely free of charge. Actually, I always wanted my own aircraft turbine, so now I have a possibility. But they, they actually charge uh, uh, by turbine hours in air. So they measure how, how much you use, actually, this, and then build a service around that. And obviously, it includes all the maintenance and everything needed to run it. So everything can be a service in the future. Now, uh, developing uh, this kind of um, full-stack uh, solution versus the market adopting is, and uh, this is a hypothetical timeline. I'm using Holvi as an example. So developing it, actually, it's much shorter, usually than getting the whole crowd to adopt it. Because in many ways, almost always, with these kind of solutions, you're moving into something that doesn't exist before. And uh, using Holovi in 2014 as an example, we actually had built a pretty amazing offering. So we had a business current account. It included a merchant account. You even got a payment card uh, through our service. And the most common question we got our, uh, from our customers is that, so how do I link my bank account to it? And we were like, well, you sort of don't. It, it is the bank account, and it's included. So, uh, but uh, 
that sort of took a lot of explanation and uh, it, it was a difficult path to actually get customers to adopt it. And usually the follow-up question was that, so how big is the company then? Uh, you're offering these bank accounts now for my business and this is for 2014, our company, it's 11 people. So we're saying that it's a fairly small company, but you can reach the decision makers easily. So, so in a sense, like uh, there's a lot of positive to have. But I think also, uh, this illustrates that you can actually do with the small team a lot of impact as well, if you do things smartly. So I think my uh, definition of magic is something that uh, you didn't think is possible. And uh, these are a couple of the magical experiences you can reach uh, if you actually go with the full stack uh, solution. So my first Uber ride, of course, nowadays it's, it's, a, it's a commodity, but my first Uber ride, there was a magical moment when I left the taxi without giving my, or the car, uh, giving my card to them or handling the cash or uh, basically trying to go through all that hassle. And I, I even asked the driver, I remember that, that can I just go now? And I was like, yeah, okay, you go ahead. And then basically that was, uh, that was the magical experience. And uh, this, I think, is the core thing of this whole uh, presentation, that this is the experience you want to convey to your customers. Uh, of course, like a robot delivering food to your doorstep, there might be some Estonian startup uh, focused on this area, but I think that's also a magical experience. Uh, or registering a company to another country uh, completely online. This is what we are offering with Xolo at the moment. And if you uh, take, uh, for example, a person in Germany who's done, gone through that hassle of setting up their business, they've spent four months in it. And uh, they first went to the notary, and then they went to the tax office, and then they got a tax advisor. And after they've been fighting in this, in this boxing ring for four months, then they finally get it. And the alternative is that you do it with a couple of clicks online. So there's a magical experience as well. And the last uh, here is uh, getting business banking from a startup of 11 people, which was the previous example. And in the end, uh, when they actually signed up, it was a magical experience. And uh, what I claim actually here is that uh, delivering these magical experiences uh, usually needs ownership of the full stack. If, if it's an experience that you actually remember after that, like my first Uber ride, then you actually have to have a deeper understanding of the whole stack. So you have to go deeper to actually be able to deliver these kind of experiences. So uh, I listed a couple of things which in my opinion uh, require uh, going full stack. And the first one is the, also the most important one. So if you want to control the full customer relationship and user experience, and that means that uh, you don't, for example, have a vendor uh, in the background. And uh, when the vendor goes down, you try to explain to your customers that it's not us, it's them, uh, this kind of a situation. So usually uh, that doesn't work. It, it always depends on whose sign is above the door. But if it's your sign on above the door and you want to control the whole user experience, then you actually have to be sure that you can control all the components of the user experience. In many cases, uh, also, if you want to uh, disrupt an old industry, like let's say banking, uh, from my experience was an old industry, in, in many cases it, it requires a full stack solution. And that goes actually to the next point here. So there's no infrastructure of vendors to plug into. So let's say that we would start Holvi nowadays, it would be a completely different journey. Because uh, actually now, you can get a wide label banking from, let's say, 20 providers in Europe alone. That you just call them, they open the APIs, and you can distribute these accounts to your customers. And uh, basically, the infrastructure, of course, develops uh, when the market develops. So uh, if there's no infrastructure, uh, then you have to build it on your own. And this is what we did also with all of this. So we built everything on our own, and we got the license even on our own with 11 people. So that was a fantastic journey, I think. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to uh, get a big leap in of, instead of an incremental change. And um, 
in many cases, uh, with products, we are talking about continuous improvement and incremental changes. And I fully believe in that one. But actually, uh, if your starting point is that you want to go uh, like a massive headway to the competition, then you also have to actually go deeper into the stack. And of course, the last one is that uh, you want to take a bigger cut of the whole transaction with you and your customer. So it's not a thin layer where you take a, just a small cut of the transaction. You want to take a bigger one. So uh, that leads me to the uh, three main topics uh, that I learned uh, basically building these kind of companies. And uh, these are, have been, in my opinion, uh, the most difficult ones, these difficult aspects. It's uh, selling the value, building trust, and establishing relationships. There's obviously a lot of uh, technical things that you have to solve and those kind of things, but those are so industry specific. So I would say that the, these three components are something that uh, usually are something you have to focus into. So um, selling the value first. So uh, this is uh, like the usual equation you, you learn in a business school. Well, I've never been in the business school. I've just heard that you, you learned this there. But anyway. Uh, so you provide uh, value to your customers, and then you're actually able to take, uh, capture some of that value. And this picture could be, for example, resembling uh, the US Airlines. Uh, they get 37 cents per uh, customer per flight. Uh, this is the, uh, capture, what they capture out of that value that they provide to the customers. So. Uh, this is uh, more uh, like the picture that we are looking into today. So we actually want to provide much more value to the customers, and you want to take a bigger cut of, uh, out of that. So uh, this would be basically the picture we would be looking into. And uh, there, I think, uh, is a very interesting question, is that should your customers actually care what's under the hood? Should your customers care you, all the troubles you've gone through in actually building the, all the layers of the stack and the experience you provide? And I think the obvious answer would be that no, they shouldn't care. But based on my experience, they actually should care. And uh, you should be actually uh, explain, able to explain what, what kind of things uh, you are focused on. I'll give an example. So. Uh, with Xolo, we are building this kind of an experience where we are putting together different components uh, that form a, form a completely seamless experience in running a business. And uh, the situation before is something that uh, consisted of multiple different components that you had to get, get in place. So you had to go, and go through the uh, incorporation, you had to get a bank account from somewhere, you had to find an accountant, maybe a reliable one. Uh, you ask some references from somewhere. And you have to get paid somehow. And basically explaining uh, that, uh, OK, here, here is a service that does it all for you. You actually have to be able to explain that how is it possible that you can do all of this? And what are you comparing to? This also helps in uh, actually explaining the pricing of your product that uh, you can compare it to all of these components that used to be there, and now you have this new solution. And it's, the experience is 10x better, but the price is even lower. The next component is building trust. And um, uh, I'll run through this, because I think this is an uh, excellent uh, sort of explanation of evolution of marketplaces. And uh, this is done by Andrew Chen. This is a blog post. I just stole it directly from there. So, uh, so basically, uh, I think this is uh, like a nice uh, journey that explains how startups are going deeper and deeper into the experience. So in the 1990s, you started with uh, moving yellow pages online. There, I think, for me, I was using Yelp, for example, for this. And the next phase was unbundling Yelp. So there uh, became like Airbnb. Uh, offering uh, hospitality services. So take, they took one category of the yellow pages and built a solution around that one. Next one, uh, uh, Uber for X. So basically taking uh, a fairly simple problem, but uh, building the whole experience around that one. So uh, controlling the supply and the demand, 
uh, handling uh, the pricing automatically, building uh, the mobile app to actually control the experience, and then uh, like all the layers of the stack that you needed to uh, deliver this experience. And of course, there's a wide variety of these kind of startups. Next one is uh, doing the same as Uber, but going into more complex uh, problems and more difficult areas. And uh, for example, Andrew Chen was using a startup in the US as an example that uh, takes the whole transaction of selling your uh, apartment. So usually what you do is that you maybe do some renovation there, you find a real estate agent, you put out the ads, and then you wait for something to happen. So this company actually does it all. So they just simply buy uh, the apartment from you. They handle all the problems in the future then uh, in renovating that, selling that, and everything that comes into the future. And uh, so basically, this also means that when you go deeper, you obviously take a little bit more risk. But the next one, uh, uh, which is, I would say, that has already started, but definitely will be the biggest category in the future, is regulated and governmental services. So basically, starting to work into more regulated areas and uh, basically also taking some parts of the uh, government jobs in the future. And I think startups are moving into this direction now. And uh, I think uh, when you go into uh, regulated industries and you go into these things that uh, might sound scary, you have to go through this kind of a thought exercise that would I trust it? And uh, you could just imagine uh, like this thought exercise. By 50% of the price, would you let a robot fly the plane you're in, for example? I don't know, 50% of the price, probably not. Uh, teach you in the university. Of course, in Finland, the university is free, but let's say that you're in Harvard, you got into Harvard. It's 50% of the fees, but you let a robot to do it. I don't know, and, uh, or defend you in a legal dispute. And I think this is actually the last one is something that will happen in the very near future. So this is something uh, that we'll see, that you have a robot or artificial intelligence that collects your case for you based on the facts. And uh, so this is basically my statement that if your uh, product is in a regulated industry, the biggest barrier is trust. I'm still waiting for the architecture startup that replaces architects in the future. Let's see when that happens. But I'm sure it actually will, at least on some level. So uh, this, these were a couple of components that we did with Holovin building trust. So uh, if you have a license, you're regulated somehow, uh, show it to the customers and show it above the fold. Yeah, usually it's, it's better than uh, explain how you protect customer data, and uh, obviously Facebook has done a lot of groundwork in here why customers are asking about this uh, more often nowadays, and I would say that this is actually becoming more and more central thing that you have to focus on. Uh, getting certificates from the outside, we did that, this with Holovi, so TÜV is a German certificate you can get, which uh, there's a couple of things that they measure the quality of your service. And especially Germany, if you are considering German markets, don't. Uh, then basically getting these kind of certificates uh, helps a lot. Uh, then partnering with big names, uh, we did this as well. And uh, actually in many cases, uh, what you get from the big partner uh, as value, uh, it's only actually the logo or the, that you can use their name in marketing. So in many cases, at least based on my, my experience, there wasn't that much value except that you can use their name in marketing. And of course, uh, show that real uh, people are using it, so the usual, uh, usual customer stories on your website. And of course, the last one is that you have to do magic. Like, if you can uh, provide that magical experience, your customers will definitely remember that. And one more note here. So, uh, mocking the incumbents, uh, I think it, it makes you look weak. So I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. So it's usually better to stand on your own two feet. Then a uh, third component uh, is establishing relationships. And uh, I just had to add this quote because this made me laugh. So there's no weaker human connection than a LinkedIn invite. And, uh, and basically, 
this also illustrates uh, that that how a product can provide a very light relationship or it can provide a deep relationship. And uh, I think the key component in building long-lasting and deep relationship is that you actually understand the outcome you get out of that relationship. So it's not varying the outcome, it's something that you can control. And uh, let's take again like a hypothetical example. So you have uh, a need to spend more time with friends. So what is the expected outcome? Actually, this isn't quite enough data yet to build the product on, because uh, in the background you might have the need to spend less time somewhere else, like home, I don't know, or uh, get energy from the uh, friends, or maybe you want to do sports. So if you have uh, a startup that offers you uh, the possibility to spend more time with friends and they always take you to the bar and you want to do sports, then the outcome is not what you expected. So you actually have to manage the outcomes. And that usually helps that you narrow down a little bit the customer segment that you're focusing the product to. And uh, what are the components in uh, establishing long-lasting relationships? So um, I think there's mutual benefits that you have to get from this relationship. So the first one is uh, what I also illustrated in the previous slide, that you actually get uh, what you expect from that uh, relationship. So the outcome is something that you can uh, predict. Next one is, uh, from a business perspective, also it makes a lot of sense that uh, experience is recurring. So uh, there's something happening on a frequent basis. So if it's a one-off, then usually uh, getting uh, also the customers, it's much more work. And uh, the third component is that both of you actually have to be in it for the long term. So, uh, of course, like building startups, uh, you, you can't always be 100% sure that you're around in five years. But I think this has to be the sentiment for both of you, that uh, you are actually making a commitment and taking a long term uh, sort of view on building this relationship. And the uh, fourth one is uh, can't do it alone. So let's say that uh, I have to prepare a legal document and I'm not a lawyer. So that would be definitely a case that I would need help from. And for me, uh, this is actually a really good criteria also for going uh, full stack in with your startup. So if all of these four things uh, are fulfilled. So, uh, that was basically uh, my main message here, and uh, I just wanted to still emphasize this old slogan that build it and they will come. They most definitely won't uh, ju by just building it. So uh, if you are solving a big problem and uh, the outcome is also big for the customers, these are the three areas based on my experience that you really have to focus on. And obviously you have to get the product working, but that's a different story. But selling the value, building trust, and establishing the relationships are the three components. Uh, that was all from me. I think we can take a few questions now, if there are some. Thank you. Do we have questions from the audience? I need to repeat them into the microphone so online people will hear it as well. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Yes, so the question was that how do you figure out the price for a value-based value product? And uh, that's an interesting question because in a sense uh, there are three ways to uh, define pricing. So one is to actually add up all your costs in the background and then base the pri pricing on that. Second one is look at the market and base your uh, pricing on what the competition is doing. And the third component is value-based, which is the most difficult one, obviously. And how, how do you get there? But uh, in a sense, uh, there are different tools in what you can do in figuring out how much value the customers uh, perceive in your solution. So um, the, I think the best uh, tools are uh, going through interviews 
where uh, you are trying to figure out the price points of your service. So uh, you uh, explain the solution and then you give a price tag to that one. And then the customers say that, well, that's way too high. I'm definitely not going to go there. Then you repeat that, you put a lower price, say that, OK, that's, that's pretty nice. It's too low then. And, uh, and then and the third one, then, then when you do enough of these, then you start to get to the point, that, uh, point when the customers say that it's a little bit expensive, but I would consider it. Then you actually found the right price point exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So basically, how do you figure out the product before you have the product? And uh, I wish I knew the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, what I've done actually quite often is that uh, I've, I've just built a mock website out of that, what the product could be, and uh, you apply all the branding on that one. You start to do digital marketing on top of that, and then you uh, start to see like how customers react. There's amazing tools, like you can track everything nowadays. So you put a Hotjar plugin and you'll see how people navigate through your website. And it might be that uh, this is something that you uh, don't even plan to build, but you're just testing out the market a little bit. Obviously, there's challenges to that one, that if you're using your own brand and then customers get accused, uh, accustomed to the fact that uh, there isn't anything there, so they sign up and then you get a nice page to say that thank you for signing up then there's nothing to see here move along move along so uh, so basically uh, there's those kind of challenges of course coming out of that approach but in a sense like uh, i think you have to try it out also you can do a lot of uh, this business analysis uh, in the background and see what what the market uh, are developing into but i personally don't believe in that one because uh, in a sense like if you want to do a big leap as i mentioned and not an incremental change. You actually have to think the logic from a completely different perspective. So this is how I see it. Thank you. More questions? I have one. I have one question. So uh, I understand uh, full stack for B2B, but uh, for a B2C and private customer, should I care about full stack? Most definitely. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the core uh, thing there is that uh, if you want to control the user experience, whether the end customer is a consumer or is, is it a business, but if you actually want to see that all the components that affect the experience, you can control them, then in, in that case, you actually have to go full stack and control and own all the components in the background. Mm -hmm. cool. All right, so thank you very we much. Conclude. Thank you very much, Mikko.